talk to you about game production at Ken. Have you heard of Ken? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 great. Yeah. Yeah. Can you name the game you Sorry, who are they? Uh, who are they? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, you made, you made Candy Crush, play Candy Crush? Yeah. Great, yeah, cool. That's my notes as well. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, it might seem a little bit weird that we've got a level slash content designer here to talk about game production, but we'll, we'll get to that, so don't worry about it. Um, this is the name of the talk that I prefer to use, why I don't talk to my producer that much, and why that's okay. Um, this, I think this is the name that's much, much more appropriate, and we'll okie dokie. Going really well. Um, okay. Why I don't talk to my producer that much and why that's okay? Game production through the perfect team building. We're going to go through three different areas. We're going to start by talking at production at King generally. So this is going to be talking about where we are now. It's going to cover the autonomous team structures that we try and create, what those autonomous team structures achieve and how they affect the projects. We'll then go over how we've achieved that. So we'll talk about what we do what we do internally and what we do externally. So what we do within the teams to make autonomous team structures work and what we do externally, how we bring new people together. If internal is the teams that we have, then external is the new team members that we bring in and how we put them all together. Okay. I'm expecting this to probably last about 30 minutes and then there'll hopefully be some time for questions but we're starting a little bit late, so we'll see how it goes. Okay. Before we get onto that, a little bit about myself. So I am a level slash content designer at King. I've been at King for about one year now, um, and level slash content design, it means, uh, you know when you open Candy Crush and there's all the little numbered nodes on the map, there's like 5,000 of them? Um, well, each of those was created, polished, and optimized by hand by one of our level slash, one of our uh, level teams, content teams. And we have to do that every single week, every single level throughout the game, constantly optimizing and trying to uh, get the best out of it we can. Uh, King is a very content-driven company. We say content is king. That's because if we don't have content, we don't have games. So it's a high-pressure situation. Uh, I've been at King for about one year. Prior to that, I was at Outplay for two years. And prior to that, I did bits and bobs, and I've got about four years' experience in total. So I'm still quite young. Um, just as important as who I am, however, is who I am not. And if you've got uh, any of the old promotional material for this, it has Sabrina's name attached to it. That's because this is totally Sabrina's talk. Okay, and I... And I got asked to step in at the last minute. Um, and there's a, few, a lot of differences between myself and Sabrina, but the two major ones are that I'm not senior and I'm not a producer. Uh, and that kind of affects the perspective that I have on this whole thing. If Sabrina is looking from a top-down level, she's seeing everything, she sees the whole forest, then I'm a lot closer to the center and I see the trees. And I see that one area of the game a lot more clearly, I see it a lot more intensely, but I don't have the overview. So this is kind of going to end up being game production from inside, which I think is a slightly different perspective from what you get usually. Okay. One of the conditions for um, taking the talk over some, from Sabrina was that I couldn't change the name, and this is the name that you have in your booklets, which is like totally mega appropriate because I have no prior experience of this talk. So um, that's we're going to piece that together ourselves. Um, when I was asked to talk about game production, I kind of started by kind of like an introspective thought of like, what does game production mean to me? How does it actually affect me? How does it affect me on a day-to-day -day basis? So we're going to talk through that a little bit um, to kind of give you an idea of what it feels like to experience game production, okay? And this is going to get a little bit abstract, but don't worry about it. So this is me. This is me working at King. And this is my team. And this is the content team. Like I say, we develop every single level for the game. We're under a lot of pressure. We've got to hit our deadlines every single week. How many levels do you guys think Candy Crush releases a week? Out of curiosity. How many, How many levels does Candy Crush release a week? 300. 300 a week. <laughs> uh, 40, 45. It's 45. Um, so it's quite a lot. Each, like, not that much, I guess. <laughs> Normally people are like, whoa, 45. Anyway, um, so we release 45 levels a week. Uh, and each of those is created by hand, optimized. We also release seasonal content. Um, so yeah, so it's a team that's under a lot of pressure. Uh, but it's also a high performing team. Uh, we hit all of our deadlines, we find time to uh, create the levels we need to make, but also to do optimizations around that. We optimize the experience, we optimize the flow, and we release features that have a noticeable impact on the game. So this is the content team. 
Within the content team, there is also a lead, and this makes it look really hierarchical, and it's like not hierarchical, but it is good for explaining things. Um, there's a lead, and he's a senior level designer, but that means that even though he's a lead, he's expected to do everything that we do. Any role that a level designer does, he's also expected to do. He creates levels, he optimizes them, he does everything that's required. In addition to that, he's also our funnel through which we talk to production. So this green dot represents our producer, who for us is Sabrina, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and you can see already that there's, if you just look at it this way, there's like kind of a big dif uh, distance between us, right? Like I don't talk to my producer every single day. My lead talks to my producer and he funnels my thoughts and I could go and talk to my producer, but I don't really need to. Um, I don't need to speak to her every day. She isn't in every conversation. And that creates teams that end up feeling really autonomous um, we're not running everything by, Sabrina's not involved in every conversation. We define our own roadmaps, we define what we're going to be doing, and it's all vetted and there's a conversation and it all it goes through a process, but in general we're trusted. <coughs> we're trusted to do what we think is right for the game, and we're trusted to make use of our own expertise. We're trusted as experts with our content. And like I said, we're a high-pressure team though, so we're a high-pressure team that's allowed to be autonomous, which is lucky that it works out. Like, we're, I said we're high performing, but we're autonomous. If we were left to our own devices and we weren't experts and there wasn't trust, then it'd all fall apart and there wouldn't be levels in Candy Crush and a million people would sign on and it'd all just explode. Um, so it's really kind of lucky that this all works out the way it does. But I don't really like that phrase very much. I don't really like saying that it's lucky because it obviously isn't. Uh, it isn't lucky that it's worked out this way. Uh, these teams were created by someone. They put individuals together in a way that would allow for autonomous structures to take place. Um, and when, you, when I started to realize that, the original name of the talk that I was given started to make a lot more sense, like game production through the perfect team building. Like I started to realize that the production that had taken place had happened sort of before. It happened in the way that they put these people together. It had happened in the choice of which people would be in the content team, and that was allowing us to be autonomous. That was allowing us to be high performing. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, because that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that we've managed to create these teams that are capable of being high performing without also being overseen at all points. And we're going to talk through how we've achieved that both internally and what we've done externally. So internally is talking about teams, externally is talking about hiring. I'm going to go through each of these areas one at a time. Eight minutes. Okay. What's going on? All right. So internally, the easiest way to explain what we do internally is to is to talk about the team structure and to talk about who the people on the team are, and then it will kind of hopefully come naturally. So I already said that um, I have two years of experience in game design. So I come at level, I'm a level designer, but I have that two years of game design experience, and before that I had another year, and I've only been at King for one year total. So. I'm approaching it from a more specific perspective. Next to me is a junior level designer who's only been at King for six months. Um, prior to King, they worked at a variety of other places, but they've kind of just got a mishmash of experience. They've been at a lot of places, they've seen a lot of things, but not for a very long time. We've got another member of the level design team who's been at King for seven years. So they've been at King for a long time. They've seen a lot of different games, which is different to anyone else on the team, and they've got a lot of experience coming from that. They've also originally they started in marketing and then transitioned into level design. So they started working in competitor insights, which is again completely different and gives them another perspective which is unique from any other members of the team. We've got our lead that I already mentioned, lead on Farm Heroes, also lead on a smaller team, Farm Heroes Champions. But what's important is the variety amongst us which I kind of skimmed over. Like we've got someone with a lot of experience of King Games. We've got someone with experience from a variety of different companies. Someone who's worked on large teams and worked on small teams. Like what's important isn't uh, that we're all members of the content team. What's important is the things that differentiate us, the things that allow us to be a varied team, the thing that give us different perspectives. On top of that, we also all have different mindsets. We, um, some of us are very data driven. We work very slowly and methodically and prefer to build learnings. Some of us prefer, if we come from smaller teams, for example, we prefer to work more quickly. We prefer to be very player-centric. Some of us are very community-driven. Like, we're all coming from different perspectives. Like, we're not just P 
people who've been in the games industry for 20 years or whatever. Like, we're all a really young team, but the fact that we have these different perspectives means we're capable of having informed conversations. But we're not just level designers. Like, next to us, we've also got our business performance manager, and we've got a data science team. But they're sat literally right next to us, and they're a member of the content pod as well. So this creates this sort of overhear culture, where we overhear things from one another. So my last week, a data scientist was looking at three levels in the game, looking at churn or whatever. They saw level 300 is particularly churny, but they can just turn to us and ask us why we don't think that is. They can turn to us and they can use our expertise to, um, to facilitate what they're doing. So we can go and look. We can look at level 300 and we can say, hey, this is the first time we put tomatoes in the game or whatever. It's a farming game, don't worry about it. Um, this is the first time we've put tomatoes in the game. Maybe that's why. And then it works the other way as well. Like I can say level 500 is the first time we put in sheep. And we've got this environment where experts can just bump into each other and organically conversations can happen. And suddenly we're all creating something that's better than any one part of it. Similarly, we've also got an agile coach, a, a scrum, scrum master right in the center of the team. They're involved in all these conversations or they overhear the conversations, which means that when it comes to facilitating our agile responsibilities, our planning sessions, and our um, retrospectives, they're more informed than they would be otherwise. And all the way over here on the circle you can hardly see, we've got the customer relationship management team. So this is, they're embedded within the content team, and again, they're facilitating and helping to make sure we're all making the best thing we can. They're, talk they're talking to existing players, they're talking to potential players, they're talking to resurrected players, and they're trying to just make sure that Everything is as high quality as it could be. If I'm talking to my lead about how we're going to approach end of content, they can say, hey, if you're going to make changes, how are we going to notify the players about that? And then they can, they can modify and they can help us to improve. And then the data scientists can come in and say, well, what tracking do we need? And suddenly we're all, we're all experts, we're all working together, we're all meshing. We've got the development pods. If you work in games, you know that um, these guys, they're working from briefs, which have come from game design and level designers, but those briefs often leave questions, but by being right next to us, they can allow those questions to be answered. It's not about stopping blockages, it's about accepting that blockages happen and resolving them quickly. And a lot of that goes through conversation. And then all the way down in this bottom corner, like really far away, like there's actually like a big gap like here, and that, that dots all the way down there is where our producer lives. That's where Sabrina sits. And the reason that she's so far away is that she understands that her job isn't to be involved in the conversations. It's to make sure that the right conversations are happening. It's not to talk to everyone, although she does. It's to make sure that when I need to talk to a data scientist, that, that conversation occurs. And when a data scientist needs to talk to CRM, that conversation occurs. So we've got all these different people, and they're contributing different things, and the right conversations are happening at the right time. But there's more than just one team. Uh, King uses a sub-team structure where we break the games down into pods. So we're always working on like five things at once. Like Farm Heroes isn't just content, Farm Heroes is four different teams and maybe these guys are working on a farm pet or these guys are working on some other thing that we're gonna push out. Um, and what's important is that it's really easy to lose sight. It's really easy for communication to fall down when there's so many different people involved. Um, and that's why we have a lot of processes in place to make sure that communication occurs. Every two weeks we meet up and we have a sharing session where we all talk through what we've been doing, we talk through the game, and again that allows expertise to, to meet each other, but it also allows, we, we let different members of the team, it's not just the leads that are talking, we let the juniors talk and the juniors represent their game, it means that we feel confident and we, we allow our game to represent who we are. It means that we, we feel responsible for the games that we're creating. So yeah, I've talked about a little bit about expertise. We have a structure that lets experts talk to each other. We have a structure that lets teams feel empowered. We're defining our own roadmaps. We're defining what we're going to work on. And that means that we are rewarded when they go well. We follow them through the whole development cycle. And more importantly, we're also accountable. Um, if I don't deliver something and I'm if I, CRM, and data science are all working on something together and we've all discussed it and we've had these face-to-face -face conversations, then I can say, well, I need to be done on Friday. And they understand they need to be done on Thursday and then it needs to be done on Wednesday. And it means that because we're having face-to-face -face conversations, we're accountable to each other and we make sure we're actually hitting those deadlines. That's really important. 
Okay, so that's all I've, said, all I've got to say about internal, and here's a really quick summary, which just kind of goes everything I said. So by having varied teams with complementary skill sets, we, uh, by, varied, uh, sorry, by having varied teams with complementary skill sets and diverse points of views, a structure which encourages, prioritizes, and highlights communication, and a production style which puts focus on letting the right conversation happen, we achieve a working environment that's diverse, safe, and challenging, an over here culture, and high performing teams are showing their own product. And all these things are super important. And we achieve them just through the structure that we put in place, through the way that we allow people to communicate with each other. Okay. Oh, oh teams which are empowered, empowered, reward, and accountable. Yeah, I mentioned that as well. Okay. Okay, so that's internally. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about what we do externally. Um, and this is mainly focused on hiring process. Um, since, again, as I'm not a producer, I'm not super informed on all the hiring decisions. But what I can talk about, I'm involved in interviews and such, but what I can talk about is, are our values. So these are the five values that King holds itself to. I'm not going to go through them, because that'll take ages. But the general idea is that the employer, the employees, as an entity, like King conforms to all of these five things. And when we're doing interviews, we're always making sure that we're assessing people based on these five different factors. So every single interview that you get at King, and every single interview for every level, from junior interns to senior whatever, every interview is based around one of these things. So I might do an interview that's specifically trying to assess you on whether you can have care and craft, whether you can be humble and open. And we're always making sure that there's an outcome that we're getting from it. Similarly, uh, if someone doesn't display one of these traits, we'll make sure that future interviews go into that thing. So if in interview one you don't display humble and open or where we raise some concern about it, interview two can focus on that area, interview three can focus on that area. And we make sure we get like, this really holistic view of everyone that we're bringing into the company. Uh, this takes a long time. The minimum number of interviews that we do is five. Uh, it can take multiple months. Uh, my interviews, I think, were eight before I got a mid-level job. So it can take quite a while. But it means that by the time that we have people coming into the company, we're confident that they're good culture fits and we know that we can invest in them and we can start to skill them up straight away. A way to think about it, and the way that we're encouraged to think about it, is using two axes, where you can think about how capable a member of the, a potential candidate is and you can think about how strong of a culture fit they are. And a lot of the time this allows you to break it down into four different areas where you've got maybe your first candidate who's low on team culture fit and low on capability, another candidate who's a perfect culture fit but again low capability, a third candidate who is low on culture fit, high on capability, and number four all the time. Both. And it's pretty common that when you come up an interview, you can work out which these areas a, um, a candidate's going to fit into, and then you can start to assess them based on that. Um, candidate one is perhaps just not interviewing for the right level. They might be interviewing for a mid-level role, but they're potentially maybe better suited for a junior role. Uh, but in either case, they're not a good value fit. They're not good for capability. That means we're probably not going to hire them. Candidate four is smashing it in both regards. Like, they're high capability. They're high culture fit. There's nothing they're doing wrong. Like, they're excellent. We might even move them up to the next level. We might inter they're interviewing as a mid-level. Maybe we think it's worth interviewing them as a senior. But either way, we don't really need to talk about them that much. What's much more likely is you end up with these kinds of people where you've got someone that fits into one of these two categories. And the way that we're instructed to think about it and the way that we like to proceed is to always err on the side of candidate number two. We prefer to err on the side of someone who is a strong values fit. That's because we know that we can teach you craft. If your capabilities are slightly lower, we know that we can teach craft, we can skill you up in that regard. But it's much harder to teach values, it's much harder to affect the person that you um, uh, person that you are. Uh, it's also pretty off common for us to uh, pivot an interview if they're coming out as low capability but a good values fit. Perhaps you're actually just a game designer but you interviewed as a level designer or are you, perhaps you're a UI artist but you interviewed as a 2D artist. You know, we, we can move people around and we can try and put you in the place that makes sense. It's also not a hard and fast rule. It's pretty common that if, um, if a project needs someone that's just going to hit the ground running straight away, We'll, maybe we'll look at someone if you know, you're know you kind of in the middle on values fit, but we need someone who's just going to come in and just smash it straight away, then it's pretty common. We might go for number three. You know, it's like not a rule, but it's just the way that we prefer to, the way we prefer to approach it. Right. All right. So 
What have I said? Um, so, by understanding what we're trying to create and having a commitment to it, by having hiring strategies which prioritize candidates that are a good fit, and by assessing people based on cultural fit uh, and adapting the interview to make sure that we're getting the best out of the candidate, we can create groups of individuals who are aligned, they have the same, the same base values, it means that they're aligned on creating the same great product, and we can also ensure that we have teams that we immediately want to invest into, we immediately want to make people as skilled as possible, we want to send them on training even though they've only, even we sometimes have people who've only been in the company a month, they're still within probation, but we'll send them on training because they've been through this process and we're, we're confident that they're going to be a long-term member of the team. All right, super duper quick run through production at King and how we've created those things. In theory, we've cut, discussed where we are and how we've got there. We've tried to do it as quickly as we can. But, yeah, that's kind of everything that I had to say. That's kind of everything that I had to say. <laughs> okay, so we started slightly late, but we still have 10 minutes of questions. Go. Um, yeah, you, you, you mentioned creativity a few times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two questions about that. Yep. The first one is, how do you assess creativity mm -hmm. when you sure. interview someone? Yep. And the second, second question is, since you release 45 or 45 mm -hmm. a week, yep. how do you make sure you innovate? Sure. sure. That's a really good question. Yeah. Excellent question. Okay. So the question is about creativity. Um, and there's two halves. One, how do we assess it? creativity in an interview setting, and two, how do we ensure that we're releasing innovative content even though we're making 45 levels a week? Okay. Uh, so, one at a time. Uh, how do we assess creativity in interviews? A lot of the time it's done through either written tests or through um, thought experiments. So it's pretty common, especially if you're in an interview for a game design position, that we'll describe a scenario to you and we'll ask you to explain your thought processes, how you approach it. Um, for example, you're working on a match three game and you've been asked to version two of um, a certain feature. So let's just say hard level labeling, which is the idea that we label levels that are really hard. And this is something we do on quite a lot of titles. You've been asked to do a V2 on that. And you've been asked to do a V2 that's specifically going to increase game rounds. And we'd see how you'd respond to that question. So, uh, and again, in these scenarios, it's just best to talk through all of your working. So version two of hard level labeling is going to increase game rounds. Perhaps you could do an event where you collect stars from hard levels and then we can give you some reward when you get to the end of it. Perhaps we can do a V2 of hard level labeling where we actually label the easy levels and we see how that has an impact on game rounds. Perhaps people are more willing to play when they know they're about to hit an easy level. You can sort of see if, when you explain your thought processes um, how, create, how your mindset works, where creativity comes up. and. Um, you can start to get a good sense of how people approach problem solving. I think that's sort of what we're doing, right? Like design is about problem yeah. solving, it's about communication. So are you solving the problem? Are you communicating effectively? <laughs> um, on to the second bit, which is about how we make sure there's creativity in content, even though we're releasing 45 levels a week. Just does that answer the first half? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, in terms of how we make sure we're releasing interesting content every two weeks, um, a few parts to the answer. Uh, one is through structure, kind of weirdly. Um, we label our levels. We label what kind of level there are. For example, is it a level with loads of exploding stuff? In which case, you know, okay, exploding level. Is it a really puzzly level? Is it a level which is, we dig through levels is something we do quite a lot. Where we've got like a wall and you've got to make matches next to it and you dig through it, you dig down or you dig up, whatever. Um, and you can put these families uh, and then you can assign different blockers to those families. So for example, this episode really needs an explodey level that uses sheep let's say. Um, we can look back and we can say, when's the last time we did an explodey level that uses sheep? And it's kind of like taking the approach of rational game design, wait, rational level design, where you really break it down into component pieces and just see how that structure pans out. And if you look back over a long period of time, you can start to get an idea of if you're repeating yourself very often. Um, the other way to do it is through large teams, which focus on um, cooperation. No level in any King game has been looked at by one person. Like, I, we're on a team of... Um, I'm not sure exactly, I can't say exact numbers, but the important thing is that we have a bunch of level designers who are all looking at every single thing that goes in. I don't put something in on my own, I put it in, someone else reviews it, and we reiterate. That means that we've got an increased chance of spotting when something's being repeated. Um, so it's kind of a structural thing there. 
even when things get through, we have people looking to check. And the other thing is always just expanding the tools that we have. Candy has, oh god, like over 50 different blockers. Like they're always adding new ones, and that means that they're always getting new tools to play with. So allow people to be creative by giving them loads of stuff. Um, have structures in place that allow you to spot repeats and plan creative content coming up, and have multiple people overlooking everything. Um, Are you encouraged to bring Yeah, that kind of um, when we're approaching a larger feature work, whether that's um, meta features, uh, new events, or whatever, or if we're approaching um, uh, level based features like new blockers or whatever. Uh, then you'll try and get as many people as possible together from different disciplines, and we have brainstorming sessions. We've got certain structures we like to follow, um, but we're always investigating new ones. One thing we like to do to warm up is we'll say, uh, how do we make this as bad as possible? For example, like, I want to add a new feature, and I want to add the worst feature possible, and we'll do that as like a warm-up session, and then we'll sort of use that as a basis to, to work out what we actually want to do. Um, but yeah, we do, we, do, we do brainstorming sessions. We try and get as many different disciplines as we can involved at basically every single stage. Hello. Yeah, sure, yeah. Especially more senior Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a fair, that's a fair question. Um, so the question is, what do we do? We have a long hiring process. How does that affect churn of applicants? Um, and how do we deal with that? It's a good point, and it's something that um, has been discussed a lot. We used to do seven interviews. We lowered it down to five for that reason. Uh, and I guess a lot of the time, it's just about finding a balance. Um, we need to make sure we have confidence about the people that we're bringing in, but we also need to um, uh, go as quickly as we can. And we have been known to expedite the, project, the process. We, sometimes we can do three interviews in one day. Um, and when you start getting to that point, you can really bring the time down. You can make it take place just in two weeks rather than multiple months. Um, the other thing that we do... One minute. Let me try and work out where I'm coming this from. Um, Yeah, yeah, okay. The other thing that's worth thinking about as well is because we're a company where we change our processes quite a lot, um, we change our, what we're aiming for, obviously, because it's a fast-moving market, we might make slight adjustments, and that can also have an impact on the hiring process. Sometimes someone's in the pipeline and the role might change, and we've just got to aim to keep them as informed and up-to-date as possible. Um, originally, we're hiring for this, but would this also make sense for you? Because we really want to bring you on, but we're having to pivot slightly on the role that we're hiring for, and we've been known to do that as well. So... We can expedite the project, but in, sorry, we can expedite the process, but in situations where we can't, it's just about keeping people up to date and just making sure there's a constant stream of communication occurring, because the worst thing that can happen and the reason people churn a lot of the time is because they think we've forgotten about them. Um, so just making sure we're actually keeping people up to date, even if the role's changing, even if the company's changing. Like, yeah, that goes a long way as well. Um, does that answer the question? Partially, great. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Okay, is there probably time for like one more? If anyone's got anything? Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, sure, why not? You described the process regarding the question. You do not talk to your person that much. Oh, sure. With all those nice topics. You described the process as kind of looking to set time rainbows. Yeah, fair enough. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, sure, that makes sense. Um, so we're talking a lot about autonomous team structure, but what happens when it goes wrong? Um, it's a great question. So one of the things that we're lucky about um, is that it's fairly easy to spot those problems when they're coming up in advance and to be able to pivot on the scale or scope of the project that we're going after. So, for example, if... Um, if we've got this autonomous teams and we realize that something perhaps isn't going to hit a deadline, we will reassess the scope of the project, we'll remove things, we design everything with multiple different scales in mind, 
So that means that here's the version that's going to go out if, if it's perfect, but if we have to start removing things, then we should, um, then these are the, pro the things that we're going to remove first. And it's kind, of, it's kind of a problem that solves itself as well, because if you're in this autonomous shape where you've got people talking all the time, then you actually end up having a really good understanding of where the project is, um, where, the pro where the features that we're working on are, that you can spot when these things are going to occur, and you can adjust appropriately, you can rescale, you can rescope, you can bring different pods on. Like I said, we have three, uh, multiple different pods all working on farm at the same time. If we need to, we'll bring pods together, we'll move people around to make sure that things are in the right place at the right time. Um, so yeah, I agree, like it's a problem that occurs when you have like these teams that are autonomous, but the autonomous the autonomy also creates other benefits that kind of outweigh it as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Mm -hmm. what tools and do you sure. Yeah, sure. So in terms of transparency, like we've got a bunch of tools that we use, um, whether it's email, Slack, uh, just having conversations. But um, the most important thing is the processes that we've got in processes we've got in place. At the end of every single sprint, we have a sprint demo where we get every single member of um, uh, all the different pods together to explain what they've been working on and to allow experts to collaborate there, and then. Every month, we have a studio demo where we get all the different projects within London together, and they'll talk through what they've been working on as well. So we manage to have transparency and communication both within the pod, within the games, within the projects, but then also between projects as well within the studios. And is there any challenges, like particularly people who don't have a huge amount of experience sure. in the industry? And that's quite a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's actually a real benefit of it is that um, because a lot of these things are just internal, like we c we're comfortable allowing a junior member of the team to represent whatever the, t the pod is working on. Like I have junior, we have juniors that come in and describe what the content team has been working on for the past month. And because it's all internal, there's very little risk there. Like it's a fairly safe space where we can allow uh, allow people to learn and allow people to skill up. So. Um, Yes, there's risks, but uh, I think because we're doing it in a safe place, like those risks are minimized and it allows people to actually skill up more quickly. Like it allows, allows people to get to a point where they can communicate in stakeholder conversations or externally, and they get to that point because we let them practice um, and let them practice re regularly. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much.